Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 noon, so we'll get started. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, just a reminder to please enter your questions in the chat at the end of the presentation, and please answer a very brief survey that will be sent to you right after the presentation. Today's uh, Grand Rounds are courtesy of the Division of uh, Respirology, Respirology Medicine, and, uh, and uh, the title will be COPD in the 21st Century. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Benjamin Smith and Dr. Brian Ross. Dr. Smith, known to many of you, is a physician scientist at the MUHC. His research program aims to reduce the burden of chronic obstructive lung disease by understanding the heterogeneity of disease susceptibility and impairment. Leveraging contemporarily deeply phenotyped cohorts, Dr. Smith uses epidemiological methods to test mechanism, mechanistic hypotheses in humans. His research support includes the CIHR and the NIH uh, centers. Dr. Smith's training is in epidemiology, respiratory medicine, physiology, and math mathematics, and has obtained uh, McGill, uh, which were both obtained at McGill and Columbia Universities. We also have Dr. Brian Ross, uh, who is a junior physician scientist at the MUHC. His research focuses on determinants and management of COPD, triggers of exacerbations of COPDs, and pulmonary rehab, as well as remote patient monitoring solutions. This clinical research program is grounded in the domains of physiology and epidemiology. Welcome to both of you, and thank you so much for presenting at Grand Rounds, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Ben, I think we, you are starting, right? That's right, Nadia. So thanks a lot for that introduction, and thanks to everyone for your attention today. Uh, so the title of the talk is COPD in the 21st Century. Brian and I put it together with, with sort of three goals in mind. One was we wanted to be pragmatic. So uh, we want to focus on high yield guideline recommendations for the diagnosis and treatment of COPD. The second goal was for it to be stimulating for as many people as possible from across the spectrum of healthcare providers, including trainees, and also the more senior scientists. Um, and the last was to evoke some hometown pride by highlighting some of the research that is coming out of the Department of Medicine that I think is really shaping our understanding of COPD in this century. So I'll get started. The objectives, first I'm gonna cover uh, the, the 2023 definition and diagnostic criteria for COPD. I'll also go over um, the changing epidemiology and emerging risk factors, or, or what I sometimes describe as the changing face of COPD. And then I'll pass the mic over to Brian, who's gonna tell us about how to manage COPD, stable COPD in 2023, and also cover uh, the important issue of exacerbations, which I think most of us encounter, whether you're a respirologist or otherwise, um, including the evolving definition um, and also how to manage it. And I'm just going to give a shout out right now to, uh, to this handsome devil, uh, Jean Borbeau, who many of you know. So he's a, a respirologist and uh, senior scientists here at the RI, uh, the Research Institute. And in just putting together this talk and, and reflecting on sort of what we know so far about COPD, Jean Barbeau has really made massive contributions to the field in every dimension. And by every dimension, I mean, clinically, uh, he's really built and led the, the COPD clinic at the chest. Um, He's an amazing advocate for patients. He's a leader in research, uh, leads a, a major cohort, a Canadian cohort of COPD. He writes the Canadian guidelines. He writes the global guidelines. He's an incredible mentor to physicians and physician scientists. So all around, a big thank you to Jean Borbeau. <clears throat> so... Let's dive in. Here's the definition, the current definition of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms, 
dyspnea, cough, sputum production, and exacerbations, and is due to abnormalities of the airways and or alveoli that cause persistent airflow limitation. So this is a mouthful. Uh, and when I'm speaking to, to trainees about COPD, I contrast this definition with, say, atherosclerosis, which is basically a plaque in an artery. That's a nice, concise definition. Uh, whereas here we have this, this long paragraph. So I think of it in three, three components. One is the clinical manifestations, so chronic respiratory symptoms. The second is the pathology, which is abnormalities of the airways and or alveoli, pretty nonspecific. And the third is the pathophysiology, which is persistent airflow obstruction. So that is what defines COPD. So what are the diagnostic criteria and how do we initially assess someone in whom we might suspect COPD? So according to current guidelines, in the appropriate clinical context, namely a patient with persistent dyspnea or chronic cough or sputum production or history of recurrent respiratory infection, we need to demonstrate non-fully reversible airflow obstruction by spirometry. And the guidelines really put an emphasis on the spirometry. They say it's mandatory. So we'll get into what, what this means, airflow obstruction, uh, shortly. Um, but I think the classic clinical presentation is someone with chronic respiratory symptoms. It doesn't necessarily mean symptoms at rest, but if someone consistently is, is breathless, say on exertion, when climbing the stairs, doing activities of daily living, that's, that's a chronic respiratory symptom. Or they might say that they always get a bad bronchitis. The bronchitis lasts longer than, it, than in them than in their peers. That's a typical um, clinical feature of, of COPD. That is in whom you'd want to to obtain spirometry. So why are we obsessed with spirometry? And I think it should be obvious to most, the symptoms of COPD are not specific to COPD. Collectively, we could probably all name maybe a thousand conditions that cause dyspnea or cough or sputum production. And so if we were to rely only on respiratory symptoms and then give out the, the inhalers or whatever it might be, there would be a ton of misclassification and a ton of mistreatment. Uh, a great example of this is the well-known gender bias in the diagnosis of COPD. There's many studies that demonstrate this in Canada and elsewhere. Here's one of them. So this was a study where they, they collected 192 primary care physicians from the US and Canada. They presented them with a standardized patient who reported cigarette smoking, chronic dyspnea, and cough. And these physicians were asked to state what was their most probable diagnosis in this context. And it turned out that if the standardized patient was male, 58% of the physicians said the most probable diagnosis was COPD. Whereas if the standardized patient was female, it was 42% of physicians reported COPD as the most likely diagnosis. This difference, this gap, uh, 16%, I think it's both significant in statistical terms, but more importantly, uh, in, in an absolute difference. That's a, that's a large proportion of people who might be misclassified. Once presented with this STEM, remarkably only 22% of physicians asked for spirometry. But nevertheless, in this, in this exercise, they, they were all given the spirometry results as we do at the SIM Center. Or sorry, at the, yeah, at the SIM Center. So after providing spirometry, which showed moderate to severe airflow obstruction, the proportion of, pay, of physicians who provided the most probable diagnosis of COPD was 74% if the patient was male and 66% if the patient was female. So what we see here is that the, the appropriateness of the most probable diagnosis is increased for both uh, men and women, and the gap has, has decreased though and is not, no longer statistically significant, although I still think this gap is, is important. Uh, in absolute terms when you think about it at a population level. So what they concluded from this study was that in North America, primary care physicians underdiagnose COPD. I'm certain it would extend to specialists as well, uh, particularly in women. Spirometry reduces the risk of underdiagnosis and gender bias, but is underused. So what do we mean by airflow obstruction? 
and how do we detect it clinically? So airflow obstruction doesn't have an intuitive meaning to 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 lay people in my experience. Um, my mother, for example, has no idea what I study. Uh, I think in, in the simplest terms, it's an impaired ability to empty gas from the lungs or exhale gas from the lungs. The way that we detect it is we use a spirometer. Uh, this is one of the, was the uh, original uh, figure from the description of the modern day spirometer in the 1840s. Uh, it was a Scottish surgeon who actually uh, developed this modern day spirometer. And notably, I think spirometry is, is one of the oldest measurement instruments in clinical medicine that is still in use. Um, it's older than the ECG, it's older than the chest x-ray, um, and it's remarkably, uh, in terms of its reproducibility, it's really an excellent measure. So that's why we continue to use it. Um, so what does a spirometer do? It measures uh, the volume of gas that is inhaled, or in this case, exhaled from the lung. We ask people to take a maximal breath in and then forcefully and maximally exhale all the gas that they can from the lungs. The spirometer measures the exhaled gas as a function of time. So you get this simple curve. Some, some notable points on the curve that we, that we like to extract are the forced exhaled volume in the first second. This is called the FEV1. And the total amount of exhaled gas, which we call the forced vital capacity. And if we take the ratio of these two numbers, the FEV1 to FVC, we, we can compute in this case, a ratio of 0.8. What this ratio is quantifying in, in practical terms is what proportion of the total exhalable gas was exhaled in the first second? How easy was it for us to, for this person to empty their lungs quickly? If someone else comes along who has chronic respiratory symptoms and we re repeat this exercise, we might see something like this, where the ratio is 0.4. So this person could only exhale 40% of their total exhalable gas in the first second, and this would be considered abnormal. The spirometric criterion for COPD is a post-bronchodilator FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 0.7. This is the, the threshold that is recommended by the current global guideline, the, the gold guidelines for COPD. Um, there's some nuances about what the best threshold is. So I'll, I'll provide some evidence or rationale behind this threshold uh, next. So what is the basis for the FEV1 to FEC threshold below 0.7? For a long time, I think it was simply expert opinion, the lowest form of evidence. <clears throat> Recently, uh, there was a, some important epidemiological work uh, by some colleagues. Uh, so they took a large sample of adults, 24,000 people, community dwelling adults, 45 years and older, who were free of COPD at baseline. They did spirometry, and then they followed these people until a COPD-related hospitalization or death or censorship. And what they did was they tested various thresholds of baseline FEV1, FEC to determine which threshold could best discriminate between those who go on to have a clinically meaningful COPD-related event, like hospitalization or death, or not. And so here's what they found. So on the y-axis, you have something called the Harrell C statistic, which is, for all intents and purposes, a measure of predictive accuracy. Higher numbers are good, lower numbers are bad. And on the x-axis, you have different FEV1, FEC thresholds. And what's pretty evident is that there is a peak around 0.7. So in this case, the expert opinion from centuries ago turned out to be pretty close to right. Um, and so this is why I think the, the current guidelines rely on this threshold. This blue bar, bar here uh, is actually the predictive accuracy if you use something called the lower limit of normal. So the lower limit of normal is another threshold that is sometimes talked about. Uh, the way that the lower limit of normal is generated is you take some arbitrary definition of what healthy is, you measure lung function, you get some distribution, and you say, if you're below the fifth percentile, we're gonna call you abnormal. There's many limitations to that sort of distributional approach. Um, one is you're misclassifying 5% of people as being un abnormal or unhealthy. Uh, two, it's not anchored in any clinically meaningful uh, outcome. Uh, so that's why I really like this, this paper where they, they really were 
anchoring it to something that matters to patients, and they concluded that 0.7 was the way to go. It's also simple to remember. So we have a patient who has chronic respiratory symptoms. We've demonstrated a post-bronchodilator ratio of less than 0.7. We've established a diagnosis of COPD. Are we done? Uh, the answer is no in terms of the uh, assessment of a patient like this. Uh, what's recommended, and, and certainly what respirologists do, is we assess a few other things. One is the severity of the airflow obstruction. We rely on FEV1. Two is the symptom burden. How much is this disease impacting them with respect to symptoms? We use various questionnaires, uh, such as the MRC, the Medical Research Council dyspnea scale, or there's various other questionnaires that we won't get into right now. But we want to know, what is the burden of this disease on this patient? The third thing we want to know is what's their exacerbation risk? Ross, uh, Brian will talk about this more uh, in his half of the talk, but briefly, uh, exacerbations are important events, and we want to know what the risk of the patient is, is of having one. The best predictor, or at least the simplest predictor, is how many have they had in the preceding year? That's a strong predictor of how many they're going to have in the next year. And the last thing that's often overlooked and really taps into all of the specialists in the Department of Medicine is comorbidities. COPD runs with other diseases, well-known. Um, cardiovascular disease and lung cancer are, are major ones, in fact, leading causes of death for our patients with COPD. Uh, but also anxiety, depression, osteoporosis, diabetes, uh, and skeletal muscle dysfunction and frailty. So this is a, a major... Uh, I think, gap in the care that is provided for patients with COPD. We often have this sort of myopic view of treating the lungs uh, and not thinking about the patient as a whole. So now we'll pivot to uh, the epidemiology and burden of COPD in the 21st century. So COPD is the third leading cause of death worldwide, and, and notably, 90% of these deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. The impact is not only on premature death, uh, COPD prevalence, so people living with COPD is very high, 10% of the global population between 30 and 79 years old, that's 391 million people, these are uh, WHO estimates, 81% um, of people living with COPD are in low and middle income countries, which has many, uh, well, epidemiologically, the, the risk factor exposures are important, but also the means of managing it is important. Um, living with COPD is associated with prolonged disability, reduced quality of life, substantial health service utilization. So it's just a major health problem. Basically, all of my grants start with, with, with paragraphs such as this. Um, and the, moreover, the burden is projected to increase due to ongoing risk factor exposure in the aging population. So locally, uh, or at least here in Canada, um, <clears throat> There is very high healthcare utilization in Canada. COPD is one of the biggest um, uh, burdens in terms of health resource utilization. So this was a study by Andrea Gershon, who's an epidemiologist and respirologist uh, in Ontario, using their health admin data. And among Ontarians over 35 years old, 11.8% have a clinical diagnosis of COPD. Quebec, it's even higher. And the Maritimes is even higher than that. Um, and among uh, these people with COPD, they account for 24% of emergency department visits, 24% of admissions, 21% of ambulatory visits, and 35% of long-term care occupancy. So they, they, there's an outsized uh, or disproportionate use of, of healthcare uh, resources. They also experience uh, clinically meaningful uh, lower levels of health-related quality of life as assessed by the these various questionnaires assessing quality of life or uh, respiratory health status. These are just the differences among those with COPD compared to those without COPD. So for the last part of my talk, uh, or this half of the talk, I'm just going to touch upon um, emerging risk factors, or at least a, an evolving understanding uh, of our risk factors. So tobacco smoke, uh, I think everyone knows, is associated with COPD. And there is no question it is a major and modifiable COPD risk factor. We should do everything we can to help patients quit smoking and ideally uh, prevent it from, from being taken up in the first place. 
However, there are some inconvenient truths about tobacco smoke being the one and only cause of COPD. Uh, first, only a minority of lifelong smokers develop COPD, even those who live into their seventh and eighth decade of life. It's not a, it's not a censorship issue. Uh, one in four people with COPD have never smoked. And some of these data are, are from Canada as well. So um, a large proportion of people with COPD have never smoked. And lastly, smoking has actually declined uh, by large amounts over the past 60 years. Uh, in 1965, about 50% of people smoked, and now we're down to about 15%. These are probably going to be a very hard, these are sort of, will be difficult to help these or achieve cessation or abstinence in these people. But correspondingly, the, the burden of COPD has not declined, even if you account for the lag in, in smoke exposure and disease onset. So smoking can't be the, the one and only cause of COPD. So uh, there's been a lot of advances in this space uh, in terms of emerging and previously underestimated risk factors. Um, so, and a lot of work has come from out of the Department of Medicine, in fact. So nauseous aerosols like air pollutants, fine particulate air pollution, ozone, biomass combustion from heating and cooking, wildfires, these are all factors that have been linked to, to COPD in like rigorous uh, epidemiologic studies. Occupational exposures uh, such, a, such as inorganic deaths account for a large proportion of COPD, particularly in low and middle income countries where safety devices are perhaps less uh, prevalent or accessible. Genetic factors do play a role, no doubt. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a well-known genetic cause of COPD. Uh, it's caused by the uh, mutations in the gene serpin A1. There's a really nice study uh, from Quebec uh, that identified a very rare genetic variant in a family, uh, a French Canadian family that, where they had extensive pedigree data. Um, and they, they discovered uh, like a, a sort of a monogenetic cause of COPD. It happens to be very rare. So it, it does not likely... Um, I wouldn't go testing sort of patients in your clinic necessarily. Uh, but then there's all, been tons of GWAS studies identifying several uh, variants that are weakly associated with COPD, uh, supporting that it's, it's really a complex disease. There's no sort of smoking gun genetic cause aside from these very small slices of the pie of COPD. Asthma, chronic bronchitis, and infections are uh, risk factors for COPD. Population-wide, um, these can account for relatively large proportions of attributable risk, like TB, HIV. And something I'll touch upon a bit more is an emerging understanding of the importance of lung development uh, and aging. So this was really a pivotal study in the New England Journal in 2015. It was classic epidemiology. They had some cohorts that they had followed across the adult lifespan from age 20 to age uh, 60 or 70. And they did spirometry across the lifespan. And I just wanna draw your attention to, the, to this later life um, period where this is where we would encounter our patients with COPD in their, in their 60s typically. But thanks to the the data that they had, the longitudinal data they had of spirometry, what they showed, this is sort of an earth shattering finding in my, in my opinion, really only half of the patients that we see with COPD followed the classical trajectory of sort of normal lung function early in life and accelerated lung function decline, presumably due to smoking, the susceptible smoker. This is like the classic Fletcher and Pedo understanding of COPD. And it's not to say that they were wrong. It, they, I mean, that's definitely a pathway to COPD. But what's really notable uh, is that, I mean, really more than half of the COPD that we encounter later in life, the trajectory that got them there was not accelerated lung function decline, but rather low lung function attainment uh, early in life. So this slope is no different from the healthy slope up here. The reason why they end up with COPD is that they had low attainment. So the punchline from that study was that about 50% of COPD um, occurs uh, among older adults is associated with low early lung function attainment and normal rate of decline. So 
we locally have been exploring this about further about what is what's the origin of this early life low lung function attainment there's a, a theory out there uh, that's referred to as dysynapsis it was introduced a while ago uh, in the 70s uh, it refers to a, a developmental mismatch between airway tree and lung size that arises early in life and it turns out that we can quantify these things reliably with ct scan and so if we look in in a large sample of about 500 seemingly healthy adults we can see this spectrum of airway tree size relative to lung size with people over here having little twigs for airways and people over here having really big fat airways uh, and this i mean this represents 25 percent of the population this represents 25 percent of the population this is the median so many of us on this zoom right now are, are down here and many of us are up here so this trait we have shown is established by early adulthood it extends throughout the airway tree it actually explains a larger proportion of the variation in lung function than tobacco smoking suggesting that it's a major player it's associated with much higher uh, risk of incident copd as well as copd mortality and now we're trying to unpack the genetics uh, as well as identify what are some early life modifiable factors uh, and we've we've come across several signals so to summarize the risk factors in 2023 this this is from the gold guide gold guidelines and I think it's well stated COPD is the end result of cumulative and dynamic gene environment interactions over a lifetime that damage the lung and or alter normal development and aging processes so uh not as straightforward as we once thought and perhaps that's why uh we've made little progress in in, in lowering the burden of disease but I think we're, we're headed in the right direction so to summarize uh so far COPD is defined by chronic respiratory symptoms and non-fully reversible airflow obstruction demonstrated by spirometry. COPD epidemiology has changed in the 21st century, including recognition of risk factors beyond tobacco smoking and ongoing high morbidity and mortality globally. So now we'll pivot over to Brian and he can tell us about how to manage this disease. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then he'll take over. Take it away, Brian. All right, so let's see. Do you guys see my slide deck there? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, okay, great. So hi everybody, um, my name is Brian. I uh, am probably less well-known than Ben uh, around here. I'm, uh, I guess I would be an import from, from another province. Um, been here for, for a couple of years now, but it's, uh, I'm a proud Miguelian and I'm, and I'm very glad to be here. So uh, I will talk about the management of stable COPD, and I will talk about kind of a paradigm shift in COPD exacerbations, uh, both of which are covered in the latest uh, GOLD uh, 2023 guideline, which uh, came out actually the early release was around November of 2022. They tend to do that a little bit on the early side. So I guess what I'm trying to do now is summarize what I think are the most pivotal changes uh, where the future of COPD is heading. Um, and uh, share a little bit of research that I think uh, that shows that that McGill and the MUHC can be uh, can be innovators and in at, at the leading edge of this. So the first quarter, I guess the first half of my slide deck is the management of stable COPD. So this is a, a very well described uh, paradigm or, or, or framework, the vicious cycle of COPD. Uh, ben did a great job of describing what airflow uh, limitation or, or chronic airflow obstruction is. Uh, and that leads to the predominant feature of lung hyperinflation, which is thought to be the, the predominant physiological uh, underpinning of, of shortness of breath or dyspnea. Now, uh, the natural history of COPD is a sort of progressive decline in lung function, but it's also marked marked by these acute episodic uh, lung, lung attacks called COPD exacerbations. And you can think of those as sort of lung hits. Every single time you, you have an episode, uh, they can be quite prolonged in terms of the recovery phase. And sometimes you can have a, a decline in lung function that you never really get back. Uh, so you have this sort of gradual decline over time in lung function. And then you also have these sort of uh, uh, episodic hits called COPD exacerbations. So cumulatively, you can imagine that with worsening progressive dyspnea, uh, getting episodic uh, COPD exacerbations, you are prone to exercise limitation and physical inactivity, which sort of compounds itself in a vicious cycle, uh, leading to sarcopenia, 
uh, essentially an inability to do your, your activities of daily living or your independent activities of daily living. So in terms of the goals of COPD management, I'll just say up front, I, I put this red and bold for a reason because you'll see a bit of a pattern uh, uh, in regards to the way that gold has approached the management of COPD. So what are our goals? Number one, to manage the chronic symptoms. Predominantly, that's dyspnea. Number two is to reduce the risk of future exacerbations of COPD. And within the pharmacological treatments for COPD, I'll make I'll, I'll sort of uh, be stubborn and say that, that the management of COPD has both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic -pharm arms. So within pharmacological, uh, inhaler therapy is the, is the backbone of treatment. So the concept of the treatable trait, which Gold has really adopted uh, since around 2019, um, the thought being uh, that we're striving towards personalized medicine for COPD management. So um, we have known for some time now that FEV1 alone is insufficient to inform COPD management decisions. And, and Ben sort of made that point that following spirometry, you're not that, uh, done there. You have to see what the history of exacerbations were or what their symptom profile is. We know that there's substantial complexity in patients with COPD. We know there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the, under the umbrella of COPD thinking of the classic textbook description of your emphysematous phenotype and your chronic bronchitic phenotype, and thinking now in the modern age of things like an eosinophilic phenotype, which is a real game changer. So in that regard, patients really need to be individually assessed for their unique set of phenotypes and for their underlying biologic mechanisms. And so they can overlap these phenotypes with one another, and they should be served as the clinician conceptually as the therapeutic targets. So a treatable trait has to have um, uh, three major items. Number one, it needs to be clinically relevant. Number two, there needs to be a biomarker. And number three, it needs to be treatable, the word treatable trait. And so that's kind of the paradigm shift in the last few years that Gold has taken in terms of how we approach the management of COPD. So since 2019, Gold has recognized two treatable traits. One is dyspnea and one is exacerbations. And we'll see sort of that pattern through the rest of the guidelines as we go through. The first major change I want to point you to is that we've gone away from the gold A, B, C, D framework, and we've gone to the gold A, B, or A, B, E framework. So we've, <laughs> we've removed C and we've removed D and we've called it E instead, okay? I guess in a way it's, it's simpler, so it's easier. Uh, the thought being number one, that the gold CCO, so we have, sorry, I'll orient us to the slide here. So first we, the, the initial assessment of uh, COPD. So first we perform spirometry, Ben mentioned how mandatory that is. We then as assess the severity of airflow obstruction. This is not the disease severity of COPD, that's more holistic. This is the assessment of airflow obstruction. We predominantly use the FEV1 for that, gold one, two, three, four accordingly. Then we move on, as, as Ben had said, we look at the symptom profile in terms of the dyspnea. So you can think of that as sort of X axis of this table here. And we also importantly ask them, ask them about the history of exacerbations in the last year. Have they had zero or just one moderate exacerbation? And we'll talk about the definition of that. Or have they had two or more moderate exacerbations or any exacerbation leading to hospitalization, which by definition uh, conventionally has been the severe exacerbation of COPD. So they, we see we've gone from A, B, C, D to A, B, E. And the reason why number one is that uh, many clinicians, many experts thought that Cs were essentially unicorns, that you, you, you're not an MMRC zero or one and frequently exacerbating. So they thought this, this was really not cl clinically something that we observed. And number two, to really highlight the fact that we're, we're, we're placing an increased emphasis on exacerbations and what that means in terms of a mortality signal and what that means in terms of quality of life and so on. So ABE is the first major shift that you'll see in the, the uh, gold guidelines moving forward. So I'm boxing here, this is the initial pharmacologic treatment. So we've done all this work, we've done the spirometry, we've diagnosed airflow obstruction, we've, just, we've said how severe it is between gold one and four, and then we put them into one of these boxes. So is it a gold three B, is it a gold four E? This is only for initial, initial assessment of COPD, okay? So now we have the box of how we initially manage them with pharmacotherapy. So initial pharmacological treatment. You see again, the two by two, well, it's not really a two by two table anymore, but you see our X axis of symptom burden, symptom profile, and we see our Y axis of the exacerbations. And they say for group A, who 
doesn't really have a big exacerbation burden or a severe exacerbation or moderate or severe exacerbation burden, you would start them on simply a bronchodilator and, and they don't have a severe dyspnea burden either. However, if you're quite dyspneic, uh, but you don't have exacerbations, a lama laba, it would be a preferred approach to take. Meanwhile, in group E, so if you, regardless of your level of dyspnea, if you are having recurrent exacerbations or severe exacerbations, full stop, you should be on at least lama laba, and you should be considering initially triple inhaled therapy, particularly using blood eosinophils as a biomarker. And really, I'll I'll say, and I think I mentioned this in a slide or two, but the blood eosinophil has been a total game changer in terms of finally we have a, a nice biomarker in, in COPD management. So A, B, E, but this is only for pharmacologic and this is only initial management, okay? So now we move on to follow-up pharmacological uh, management. And I'll say as many arrows as this looks like, it's actually less complex than last year's uh, gold iteration. And what I would argue philosophically, the evidence hasn't changed that much between the last installment and this installment as it relates to inhaler therapies, large inhaler therapy trials. However, I think the philosophy has changed to be more aggressive as a group, as a body to say, if patients are dyspneic, we should be dilating earlier, bronchodilating earlier. If patients are having exacerbations, they should be on triple therapy. What you're not seeing is LABA ICS. So that's sort of been removed in large part. It, it, it's come to a point where if you think a patient would benefit from a, from a lab ICS, you're, you're inclined now to put them on triple therapy. So I talked about the, the concept of the treatable trait earlier in the presentation, and we see it again, follow-up pharmacological management, dyspnea as a treatable trait or exacerbation as a treatable trait. If you have both treatable traits, then you follow the exacerbation pathway. What we can see in large part, dyspnea is quite simple. We give them a bronchodilator, then we give them a dual bronchodilator, and then we think about uh, adherence and technique, and we can even rotate molecules within the same classes. For the exacerbation category, you start with a bronchodilator, then you pretty quickly go on to dual uh, bronchodilation, which itself there has been evidence for a reduction in exacerbation risk. Uh, and then you, you quite quickly go on to triple therapy or ICS-containing therapy, either um, from this pathway or from this pathway. And that, as I mentioned, we are really leaning on the blood eosinophil in this case, okay? Then we consider oral therapies such as azithromycin, riflumilast, or NAC. And I'll, I'll save questions to the end, uh, just keeping, uh, keeping an eye on time. So in terms of the treatable trait of dyspnea, if we, if we approach this as physiologists, we know that flow, uh, the resistance of flow through a tube uh, is uh, inversely proportional to the radius to the power of four. So what does that mean? That means that minute changes in the internal radius of your airway can have massive consequences for the resistance to flow. Ben made a great point that COPD is a disease uh, where you cannot deflate the lung. So you, you have a very floppy compliant lung that you can inflate quite easily, but through the chronic bronchitic phenotype, we have a bunch of gunk in the airways that reduces the internal radius of the uh, airway. And then through the emphysematous phenotype, we have the loss of the tethering of the nice spongy lung tissue that tethers the airways open. So you get floppy airways that close in on themselves with, uh, with positive intrathoracic pressure. So you're left with small and floppy airways. And so you can't deflate the lung. And so that's a big deal. And if we, if we follow the, the convention of, of Poussoy's law, any changes that we can make to open the airway up may have a significant benefit in terms of the symptom profile. So on the bottom here, we have a meta-analysis. This is sort of blood and guts physiology. Uh, CPET studies, uh, sort of six, six CPET studies where they did uh, a TLIM uh, test, which is a time to limitation. So at a, at a given uh, uh, power output, uh, you see how far patients uh, can go, patients with COPD can go. And then they also looked at the inspiratory capacity because keeping in mind, we hyperinflate when we have COPD. And so we want to deflate the lung to, to give us breathing room so that we're not at our volume stealing because we move along the x-axis in a leftward direction if, if we have uh, COPD. So we wanna deflate the lung, we wanna increase the breathing room, the inspiratory capacity. That can be dynamic or resting as I show on this trial here. So all that to say, when you compare lama laba versus monotherapy alone or placebo, you do see a favorable effect in terms of your exercise endurance time, in terms of your inspiratory uh, capacity, 
And also, this is the IMAS trial, a bit more of a, a recent evidence from, from uh, Dr. Malte uh, in Quebec. Um, impressive uh, improvements, not only in terms of blood and guts physiology, in terms of your FEV1 and your and your, uh, your inspiratory capacity, but also importantly for the patient in terms of your uh, dyspnea scores. This is the transitional dyspnea uh, index score. And so we're seeing these market improvements. So bottom line, if they're dyspneic, if that's their treatable trait, bronchodilate them. So if we have a treatable trait of exacerbations, as I mentioned, a foreshadowing before, the bloody eosinophil has been a game changer. But keep in mind, this is not a categorical thing. This is more of a linear thing. So we see a linear sort of res response in terms of the peripheral eosinophilia of, uh, of patients living with COPD and the response to inhaled corticosteroid. Um, I should note that at, at, uh, at the MUHC, we're, we're 100 means 0.1, 300 means 0.3, and so on. This is a, a nice traffic light, green light, uh, green light, yellow light, red light, which I really like. It's been around for gold for a couple of years now. Um, again, as I said, the, the tone is more aggressive this year. So even the yellow light is favoring you. So we're kind of pushing towards triple therapy more and more with, uh, with the new guidelines. But all that to say, the, the factors which would favor triple therapy or ICS containing therapy would be a history of hospitalizations, uh, two or more moderate per year bloody eosinophil profile, again, one of our main biomarkers now, a history of or concomitant asthma. So you'll know in my Monday afternoon COPD and pulmonary rehab clinic, um, you'll know that I, when I get a new consult, I am searching and searching for any, is there any childhood asthma, any childhood recurrent uh, uh, respiratory attacks, being in and out of the hospital, was there any prior spirometry or PFT that showed reversibility, any composant asthma? We're always, always searching for it because it really does affect our management. Uh, favoring use, mo one moderate exacerbation or sort of a moderate eosinophil profile. And against use, of course, if you have sort of honking consolidative pneumonias repeatedly, that might be a reason to hold off. Uh, with many, many retrospective studies have demonstrated that bloody eosinophils less than 100 are the patients that are very likely not to benefit from that additional benefit from ICS. And then, of course, if there are uh, concomitant infections, then stay away from ICS. So if I were to summarize that uh, part of my talk, this would be the slide in terms of pharmacologic management of COPD. So following the initial, uh, if we remember that initial goal 2023 slide where we did spirometry, looked at the sip and burden, looked at the exacerbation risk, you perform, you, you, gave, you prescribed an initial therapeutic management. Now in the follow-up, you're using the treatable trait. Do they have a treatable trait predominantly of dyspnea, predominantly of exacerbations? or of both? And if so, use the exacerbation pathway. If they are dyspneic, bronchodilate, remember that physiologic slide. If they have exacerbations, add on ICS probably earlier than we usually have in the past. Also keep in mind exacerbation severity and frequency. Those are patients that would benefit. Eosinophil counts that are really high, those patients would benefit. Keep in mind weighing the, the pneumonia risk. Asthmatic component is a really, really big part of ICS containing therapy. Um, and then if there's no response to that, consider inhaler technique, adherence, rotating devices and molecules, then consider oral therapies because of the uh, length of time I have to talk, I'll have to stop there in terms of the, the pharmacologic approach. I just want to make a point here that equally important is the non-pharmacological management of COP. Do not forget about smoking cessation. Do not forget about vaccination, pulmonary rehab, or self-management education. This is a wordy slide I'll just leave for your reference here. But you see they follow the same treatable trait paradigm, which is excellent. I think that's a really great installment. I'll say that not much has changed in terms of oxygen therapy. The studies from the 80s still stand, and they are the backbone of our, our recommendations, both provincially and nationally, for who gets oxygen. Uh, there's actually been a couple of negative studies uh, most recently in terms of pushing the boundaries of who would benefit uh, from oxygen therapy. But I will say that in terms of the non-pharmacologic realm, uh, non-invasive uh, uh, home long-term uh, uh, ventilation uh, in very, very highly carefully selected patients um, actually does have does appear to have a, a very significant uh, COPD exacerbation and perhaps even mortality signal. So to summarize, we see that pharmacotherapy and non-pharmacotherapy are important. And as it relates to mortality, in fact, uh, one might argue that we're actually accumulating more evidence in terms of the non-pharmacologic uh, therapies than we do for the pharmacotherapy. 
So let's move on in the last five minutes or so to exacerbations of COPD, uh, which has been a, a big conundrum, I guess, for the last 40 years or so to, to define it and classify it and how to do that in the best way possible. So um, <clears throat> pretty much leading up to and including the current guideline, we have said that the, the definition of a COPD exacerbation is an acute worsening of respiratory symptoms that results in additional therapy. We have defined it that way and we have classified it post hoc. In other words, we've said that if they ended up only needing short acting bronchodilators, it was a mild exacerbation. If they needed antibiotics and or corticosteroids, it was a moderate. The second they walk into an emergency department or onto a hospital ward, by definition, they'd become a severe exacerbation. So there are obvious problems with that because we're just defining it by the way we chose to, or they ended up being treated rather than to think about underlying mechanisms uh, or, or quote unquote objective uh, markers. So that's changing in a big way. And I'd say this, this year is a sort of an important transitional year. So the goal 2023 guideline defines a COPD exacerbation as an event characterized by increased dyspnea or cough or in sputum, that sounds very familiar, that worsens in less than 14 days. So for the first time we have, a, we have this timestamp that's longer than we previously thought, which may be accompanied by tachypnea, tachycardia, and is often associated with inflammation caused by infection, pollution, or other insult to the airways. So wow, in, in a new definition, we have uh, our typical symptom profile, but we have a new duration. We have quote unquote objective physiologic markers, things like tachypnea, tachycardia, and we're, we're talking about systemic inflammation caused by a variety of underlying causes. So thinking outside of the, um, of the infection bubble, um, we have uh, on the far left panel exacerbation causes, both infectious as well as non-infectious. We're thinking about how they can all cumulatively cause, cause inflammation. Think about Puzoy's law and the inflammation and what that might cause to the resistance of, of the airways and mucus hypersecretion. And then we're also thinking about the pathophysiology. pathophysiology. And I'll touch on this in, in a couple of slides, but this comes from the Rome proposal, which came out in December, 2021. Goal 2022 usually comes out in November, 2021. So this iteration has start to, started to introduce and adopt uh, uh, this novel way of thinking about secret exacerbations. Just for time, I'm gonna skip over this slide. Uh, so here we have a new way of classifying COPD exacerbation. We just talked about the definition, the new classification, and it's a busy slide, and I'll just leave it for your reference, but we're using, use, using dyspnea on a visual analog scale. We're using, quote, unquote, physiologic uh, parameters, respiratory rate, heart rate, uh, oxygen saturation, and also markers of inflammation if you can get it, CRP, for example. If you meet three or more of these criteria, you move on from mild to moderate. And if you have all the criteria, if you have the criteria of meeting moderate and you've done a blood gas showing hypercapnia and ac acidosis, you've met severe. So this is the new paradigm shift in the way that we're starting to think about COPD exacerbation classification and severity, though it needs to be prospectively validated. This is the result of a Delphi meeting, um, the Rome uh, criteria. We also are thinking about the differential diagnosis. As Ben mentioned, these are very nonspecific symptoms, so we have to investigate uh, the other possible causes. And we also starting to think about etiology in a way that we never did before. Uh, I'll just sort of make the unfortunate mention that that the the evidence for management of exacerbations has really not changed uh, much at all, in fact. So the cornerstones being uh, corticosteroids, uh, antibiotic therapy, short acting as well as long acting bronchodilator therapy. I should just make a point that goal 2023 says there is not enough evidence to say one way or the other, but we recommend keeping long acting and short acting on at the same time. Uh, this is a really nice editorial that came out about a week or two ago saying that uh, this requires prospective validation, this new uh, definition and, and classification. And people are quite worried. This is a lot of physiologic data that we need to, to collect. If we're not in an eMERGE or acute care setting, how are we going to get, you know, uh, respirate, heart rate, SAT, CRP, et cetera, blood gas? Uh, it seems very impractical. Um, so I'm running out of time, but I'll just go sort of mentions uh, an innovative and exciting research project that we're launching uh, using wearable technology. So for the first time being able to monitor outpatient, uh, ambulatory outpatients it, using comfortable biometric wearable devices. Uh, this is myself, this is my last 72 hours. In fact, yesterday I was very sedentary, ironically putting this very slide together. 
But the two days before I went, I drove over to Gatineau to, to train for the Canadian Ski Marathon. I put on two uh, research grade biometric wearable devices. One is specialized in sleep uh, and one is specialized in daytime tracking. So I have my sort of sleep scores and how they change, including REM sleep and the duration of deep sleep and my, my sleep onset, et cetera, for each of those nights. Uh, and we also see on each day with, uh, with the sort of uh, masochistic skiing that I did, uh, you know, uh, the acceleration, the step counts, the heart rate uh, that's being monitored. Um, so what does this look like uh, in some early pilot work on the left, far left and far right? This is actually a 20, 21 plus day period. Uh, a patient with gold three COPD, a patient with gold three COPD, and me as a healthy control in the middle. Uh, this on the very top is the is a validated uh, symptom profile. So they do this remotely with a tablet every single day from home. They wear the two uh, wearable devices. I'm just showing data from the nighttime wearable device, showing the rest, resting heart rate and respiratory rate. Uh, so just proving that it's actually quite possible to monitor these patients, learn about the peri uh, exacerbation period, and contribute to the evidence that's needed. So I'll summarize there by saying, to summarize Ben's first half, saying that COPD is a heterogeneous lung condition, diagnosed on spirometry, has a shifting epidemiology, and has an evolving understanding of our risk factors and pathogenesis. Uh, on my side of things, I'll say that the evidence-based management of COPD includes both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. Both can be implemented using this treatable trade approach, and both has been demonstrated to improve mortality. The new framework brings us into uncharted territory that requires prospective validation and research. Uh, the definition incorporates, for the first time, tachypnea, tachycardia, inflammation. The classification includes a dyspnea score, the physiologic parameters I talked about, and even blood work like CRP, as well as uh, blood gases. And then the underlying cause is actually caked, built, uh, uh, baked into the definition itself by considering what is the underlying cause of the inflammation. Is it infection? Is it pollution? Is it some other insult in, for the first time in 2023? Uh, and finally, I'll say that our ability to help our patients has come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So with that, I'll end. Thank, Thank you, you much. so much, uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Smith, for this fantastic, comprehensive overview. And really, congratulations on all the work that you are doing advancing this field. We have lots of questions, but first we have a comment from Kaberi Daskupta, who says, I must mention Dr. Smith's seminal study in JAMA 2020. Uh, and, and apparently you really advanced the field in this uh, in this area. So uh, Ben just noted. We do have questions. Dr. Rosenblatt is asking, with the survival of more and more premature babies who have had RDS, has this influenced to an important degree the amount of COPD we see out there? Uh, so I, I think it's directed to me. The empiric answer is I, I, I don't have one. Um, I think that from what we know of, of RDS and bronchopulmonary dysplasia and, and related illnesses that occur in preterm uh, births, I suspect that the, the burden epidemiologically compared to other mechanisms, it'll probably rel be relatively small, though to the people who experience it, uh, they are very important Plus, uh, that's a manifestation that is, well, it's manifest across the entire lifespan. So the burden, depending on how you consider burden, can be be outsized or quite large. So um, it's certainly an area of, of research that we're interested in. My program, despite being an adult respirologist is, and who is interested in COPD, has, is really <laughs> focusing more and more on early life origins. And so... Uh, these pathways and, and how lung development is disrupted both in utero and postnatally is of great interest as well as the genetics. Fantastic. That... Brian, uh, question for Brian. If you watch CNN, direct advertisements to consumers for COPD is only surpassed by advertisement to of drugs to lower H1C in diabetes. So how does this influence the care of patients and the costs of health care? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's a bit of a loaded question. It's hard to, hard to answer that. I would say that uh, you know, if it's almost like the, the gold 2023 panel was watching those advertisements, I'm, I'm joking. Um, but, but what I would say is, I think for a long time as a group, uh, if you compare, for example, the respirologist to the cardiologist, we might be a less aggressive bunch. In other words, if you look at our guidelines over the last 20 years or so, we often like to take a stepwise approach. 
Whereas perhaps what we need to do is take an aggressive approach using the right biomarkers and uh, the right being guided by the right phenotypes. So, uh, you know, as I said, the evidence really hasn't changed between gold 2022 and 2023, but I, I would say, I would argue that there's been an aggressive step forward in terms of earlier uh, addition of bronchitis. So, you know, the way a couple of years ago, you might've treated a patient with uh, COPD might be a LAMO bronchodilator for dyspnea, then see them in follow-up in three, six months and, and you know, LAMO laba, whereas the, the latest iteration of the guideline might say something like, start with LAMO laba early, as we talked about physiologically, why not bronchodilate? Why not give them every chance uh, at, a, at a good quality of life? So I hope that's a reasonable answer. I would say in general, I would agree with you in, in that uh, we're being more and more aggressive in terms of upfront uh, pharmacotherapy. Yeah, and, I, and Stephen Grover's following up on that. Uh, if we're treating cardiovascular disease a little bit better, uh, what's happening, you know, advancing age, are you seeing more elderly COPD patients? Yeah, absolutely. I we we say this often, and I don't. I'm not sure if Jean Barbeau is on the line, but also a, a large shout out to to Jean Barbeau, a big uh, mentor. But we we talk about this weekly that we're sort of a victim of our own success. In other words, we are keeping these patients alive longer and longer, keeping them out of trouble longer and longer. And so when you have a you know subspecialty COPD clinic, these patients are, are very sick. This is a disease of multimorbidity, uh, very very severe disease. And so it's tricky to, to, you know, you want to stay within the con confines of guideline recommendations in terms of uh, durations of therapies and types of therapies, but you also know that this the patient in front of you would not have made it into the trial, so it, it gets a little bit tricky. We're, 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 we need to generate new evidence with these ever-increasing severity cohorts of COPD to guide exactly how we manage them. It's difficult. Uh, thank you for that. What about emphysema? Is it still important and how does it coexist with COPD? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that the, the classic textbook definition of chronic bronchitis and, and emphysema holds true. Uh, I didn't even touch on this, but there are surgical interventions, there are bronchoscopic interventions that, where you depend on the anatomy in terms of heterogeneous emphysema, uh, 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 if there's collateral ventilation or not, etc. So if that, if there's a mechanical, so if you have emphysema, you, your, your alveolar capillary interface is turned into Swiss cheese and you just have basically redundant tissue that's not participating in gas exchange and it's mechanically leading to hyperventilation, then the mechanical solution would be to, to remove that emphysema to inflate the better parts of the lungs. So absolutely it's relevant and it's, you could consider it almost a treatable trait for some of our interventions that I didn't have time to go into. Fantastic. We're running a little bit low on time, but a practical question from Patricia Zanelli. There are so many new inhalers to choose from. Are there any that are preferred or do they provide slight different effects or have different properties? Can you give us a brief review on that? How much time do we have? <laughs> I, I, so I, I would say, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Ben, if you have any preference or uh, I'll, I'll just say one thing that in our COPD clinic, there's also this sort of competing interest where we need to be mindful of, of, uh, of the global community, of uh, climate change, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the molecules deposit patients in our sickest patients. So in other words, uh, one thing, one additional way we have phenotyped our patients is there are a lot of dry powder inhalers, and then there's a lot of non-dry powder inhalers. If you do not have the sufficient peak inspiratory flow uh, necessary, then, it, then you're sort of shooting or, or you're, you're sort of breathing uh, breathing in the, the dry powder into the back of your throat instead of deposition into the lung where it should be, uh, where it should be acting. So all that to say, uh, this has become a game changer in our clinic for sure. And there's a study led by Jean uh, right now ongoing in terms of how that's going to change our practice. That is one of many uh, uh, strategies that we use. There's a section in goal 2023, thinking about uh, the dexterity, local costs, uh, patient-specific uh, uh, factors, but also following that that paradigm of exacerbations of dyspnea. Fantastic. So we are out of time. Uh, really, thank you so much. First of all, you know, obviously, uh, McGill has had a long-standing reputation as being a, a major leader in this uh, in, in respirology medicine, and uh, it's great to see sort of this next generation coming through and and keeping that bar really high. So, congratulations for all the work that has been done and that you are continuing to do to keep up. Uh, that really strong reputation at McGill. So thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for the wonderful overview. Uh, you had 147 participants today. So uh, a lot of people, 
I think uh, got the message and and can keep uh, can keep you know forwarding uh, the message to other people. So congratulations on all your work and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye.